Hello everyone and welcome to this episode, the learning design one of the Women Talking About Learning podcast. I'm Andrew Jacobs. One of the things which fascinates me about doing the podcast is how our guests take the topic and interpret it in a way which suits them. We don't know where the topic's going to go and sometimes neither do they. This week's guests are Lena Nasiakal and Vanessa Satano. Lena is a learning consultant and EMCC accredited coach and holds a master's degree in lifelong learning and a BSc in educational studies. In 2017, she founded Lena's Moves, a trusted L&D partner for organisations like Netflix, H&M and Johnson & Johnson. Vanessa is a dedicated professional, deeply passionate about fostering lifelong learning and personal growth. In her role as a freelancer, Vanessa serves as a soft skills trainer, facilitator, coach and learning and development consultant, leveraging her versatile skill set to empower individuals and teams. This is a superb episode which looks at learning as a whole and is an essential listen. Recorded in March 2024, this is Women Talking About Learning. This is Lena and Vanessa talking about learning design. Hi Lena, how are you? Hi Vanessa, good to see you. I'm very good, and you? Yes, I'm very good as well, excited to do this. So today we're talking about the learning design and what what comes to your mind first uh, when we talk about the learning design? What comes first? I think it's it's the passion that I feel uh, when it comes to learning design is the thing that makes me wake up in the morning very excited and it never happens in one go, you know, when you want to design a workshop and I know you run uh, workshops on critical skills. I feel like if we do a design, then it takes me quite some time to get into it and I need also some time to uh, to come up with creative ideas, with non-boring ideas. And uh, yeah, it never happens in one go. And that's what excites me. It's not an easy process. It's not that you know you're going to put one or two or three ingredients and then poof, you're going to get a cake. No, it's a very creative process and it happens in many different uh, ways for me. How about you? Yeah, for me as well. I, I was hearing you and I was thinking, yeah, I it's one of the of the things that I I love the most about this of course is uh, being there with people and and giving the training but I also like very much this part of constructing the the training and thinking about uh, dynamics and exercises that I can put I can add I can change sometimes and imagining uh, the impact that those exercises can can have and how people will receive them, if it's going to be fun, uh, if they will be surprised or not. Uh, yeah, I also love that part of uh, creating, I think, I try sometimes to create some some surprise. I think it's one of the things that can enhance uh, the learning and the transfer of the of the learning. Yes, I love that, um, and I'm very curious to hear what kind of surprises because I think we are quite aligned in the way we design because. I call it psychological beginning, like start with something that is challenging for people and that they don't expect, so they can feel that uh, they are here to learn something and this way we can soothe and uh, resistances. But I'm also curious to hear what kind of surprise elements you are using, if you could give an example or two. Sometimes it's, uh, it's only, um, for example, I love to use uh, an image of um, several chips and uh, one is on the floor one is uh, very uh, seems to be very happy uh, one is laying down and uh, they are nine um, uh, doing different stuff or or with different emotions and I ask how do you feel uh, today and uh, what kind of chip uh, of chip 
do you feel today? And uh, they laugh a lot because they, the images are very funny. And, um, and of course, uh, they are surprised because I'm asking that. And it's a way of um, telling them that learning can be fun and can be relaxed and they can be comfortable there. And, uh, and I try that the training can be a moment for them to be as they are and just be there, be relaxed, be comfortable and also spend a good time with their colleagues or with their friends or whatever. Um, it's just a good time because actually I think some people have... Um, not a very nice memory from school and uh, when they hear about oh I'm going to have a training session in the company sometimes they they don't choose to have this training uh, so they have like a, a cold expectation or they don't know what to expect or they think they might be uh, bad stuff or whatever can be boring at least and um, it's a way of de uh, deconstruct every uh, bad perception they can or expectation they might have uh, about learning and I think um, it's very nice to see them laughing uh, at the beginning yeah oh yeah and you raise off the energy as well and yeah. have all these underlying messages that you're sending in a in a non um, uh, non-direct way that you're saying hey it's going to be fun hey it's going to be different hey you can be yourself that's all things that come along and i, lo I love the piece of as you say of deconstructing all the images that we have about learning, which are mostly connected with school or uni. And in my opinion, that's the most, that's the biggest challenge for us as uh, designers or facilitators. And when, I don't know in your experience, but many times when I work with, say, managers, uh, they are like, no, but our people are not, uh, yeah, they just want to hear something and they just want to, and I'm like, yeah, well, you think too little of them, you know. Your people are also creative and they want to enjoy. But it's the images that we have about learning that they are, they are very, they put constraints. It's like the, the prison that we built for ourselves. And that's, that saddens me a lot because I love learning and I love this, as you say, fun, non-boring learning, learning that people enjoy, that they're like, oh, we're going to have a session. Yes, let's go, let's go. <laughs> not, oh, no, yeah. no, not again. Yeah. And I think sometimes, I don't know it, uh, if it happens to you in your experience, but um, people expect not only a boring session, uh, but they expect to be there in a very passive way. Because they uh, they remember school when they were just sitting there listening listening to a teacher that was talking about some topic, and then they they were supposed to write down what the teacher was saying or putting on the board. So sometimes they 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 have this this passive. Uh, way of being there and uh, sometimes we have to pull pull them to to be more active and to to be more participating and in the session so i try to build every training in a very experiencing way and I, I was thinking about what you were saying about this uh, process of constructing and designing the, the training that is a process that you go there and then you come back and then you come back and 
it happens to me a lot because first I I put the goals of the of the training session and then I try to select the content that can um can lead them to 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 the to the goals and um one of the things that I come back a lot is when I'm trying to build a logical structure to the training and that part and then the 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 exercises the selecting the exercises and be aware if the session is balancing if there's not very uh if there's not a a part of the session that can be very theoretical and uh, passive for them so i go back lots of times to make sure that is balancing and there's a logical structure and that's the thing that i i think i spend most time uh about the 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 designing of the of the trainings it happens to you yeah yeah i spent for me it's uh i don't mind how much time i spend i know i spend a lot of time on design but i love it so much uh i remember that when i was like i don't know how many years ago but many years ago <laughs> I was doing a master's in adult education and lifelong learning. And at the same time, I had my first trainees. And I remember for one hour of a class or of a lesson, I would spend at least like 10 more or more hours in constructing and designing. And my parents were like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. You don't even get paid for all this pretty work you do. You can just go and, you know, just follow the book and whatever. And I was like, I don't care. This is what gives me energy. And I see nowadays that um, I start usually from when I have the objectives and when I have the challenge and the inconvenient situation that people face when this is set, then the creative process for me doesn't start with a concept per se, but starts starts with my favorite piece of the the training. And that's usually an experiential exercise that I will create or I use a lot of embodied learning. So that could be through dancing, through theater, through meditation, visualization, you name it. And then I've noticed that on my way to the gym, for example, or on my way when I cycle, I, I do the moves. <laughs> but people won't see you, they will just listen. So I, I live in the Netherlands, so I cycle a lot. And then when I go to the gym or on my way to the dance school that uh, I'm learning salsa now, I come up with ideas and more ideas and I'm like, oh, this is, and this is how I start constructing things around. And I'm like, okay, if that's, if that's my, my centerpiece, that's the thing that I love them and they're going to experience it and it's going to be mind blowing for them. How do I prime their brains before? How do I support them to create, to, to enter in the right um, sphere of mind in order to participate in this exercise so how how do i feed their um, their uh, cognition a little bit and then after the the exercise what kind of debriefing is needed what kind of questions should i ask uh, should it be in a setting of the whole group in a plenary setting should it be in couples uh, should it be in trios should they stand should they walk should they what could support the learning the most so this is how how the process works, and um, I think I wanna at some point I wanna start um, explaining this a little bit more because people are keep asking. But how how do you come up with this? And I'm like, I don't know. It's just it's 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 a whole process. I, I to come back to your point about balance. I think yeah, balance is also very important. What I usually see is that uh, the sessions are they have the following structure. You start and then there is like 80% of the time you listen to somebody talking. <laughs> you might put something in the chat here and there, but maybe not even. And then you have to do an exercise in five minutes before the end. And then you're saying, oh, but I'm so sorry, we don't have time uh, to finish the exercise. And oh, I have questions. Oh, we are running out of time. And for me, this is so funny. And it's also frustrating because... 
you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of when I was a little girl and we would go with my parents somewhere, like to a friend's house and we would play. And then at the moment, you know, that everybody's warm and is playing and we became friends with the other kids. Then the parents come in and they say, now it's time to go home, go away. <laughs> No, we just started, you know, now we just geared up and we are ready. So, yeah, so I think this is completely unbalanced. And I prefer if there are small cycles, uh, like a bit of theory, uh, an exercise, a debrief, and then again, a bit of theory. So at least I try to have at least three of these cycles uh, in a one-hour workshop. So there is always, there's always something different. And also they feel that they can play before the adults kick them out of the <laughs> of the guest house <laughs> yeah yeah but also because uh our capacity of uh having great attention and focus uh is more or less 20 minutes so if you are talking for several hours people won't be able to to focus or real uh, to acknowledge that that learning that they should so it's very important to to have to have uh, um, an experience um, for at least every twenty minutes or so, and also I try to to have different um, uh, exercises in order to or different ways of of giving uh, the the session in order to to go for different uh, people because there are people that are more visual and people that are more kinesthetic and people more auditory. So I try to to have exercises that people will have something with their, their body or uh, working with someone or uh, telling them some tales or some stories or videos uh so in, in order to to go to different people and i think that's very uh, important too and also to repeat in every blog the the key points because when we have a four hour session um which happens to me a lot or one day uh, a whole journey session so we are going to talk about different topics in a great team. So um, I try to every step of the way that I'm going to change a little bit the topic to go to the, the key points in order for them to, to acknowledge the, the, those key points. So I think that's also uh, very important for us when we are uh, designing to have space for them to um, to acknowledge these these key points before going through another theme. Uh, but yeah, I was uh, thinking about what you were talking now of um, the the process. I don't know. Also, uh, the same as you, when I have those ideas, but. Um, I know that there's that process of setting the goals and balancing the session and selecting the content and uh, giving that structure and and um, selecting those exercises regarding all of this. But sometimes I like to change exercises uh, and pick one exercise and giving uh, uh, another way of of um, of doing that sometimes it's because uh, i saw or i read something or i heard something and that came to me in uh, in another way um but i think the the creative process is something that it's very difficult to explain don't you think yeah yeah it is i don't know what is the point that uh, I think I think there are several ways of doing that, uh, not just one way. I think that's it uh, because sometimes it's it's something that we've we've saw or we heard or um, we've read about, 
but some sometimes is is this way of okay i think i can do this in a different way it's not always inventing something new it's sometimes it's picking a thing and giving a different cloth to different clothes to this to this thing that you already did certainly and uh, the way that i see it is that from where do we get our source for of inspiration so some people are saying yeah but how do you make things experiential you do things experiential i do them as well and they are asking but how how does that work and it you, i can't be like in this mindset when i'm just sitting and reading or listening I have to be also in a, in a different state. So for me, uh, ideas are coming when I'm playing board games, for example, or when I'm dancing, or when I'm even in the fitness room in the sports hall, and then I do something and I'm like, oh my God, this exercise is really good if you want to teach resistance to senior leaders. I'm going to take it and I'm, I'm going to do it. And it, it's the whole fun of it, but or in improv theater. But we have to immerse ourselves, I think, as learning designers in these, uh, in these opportunities because this is what brings a lot of inspiration. This is what uh, makes our creativity uh, flow and helps yeah. us out. Yeah. I think um, also I, I like to give them metaphors because I, I think it's a... a it helps us to memorize things. So giving them metaphors with, sometimes there are uh, expressions that we might use in our daily lives, sometimes with an image uh, that can be a, a metaphor uh, and sometimes with an exercise uh, like uh, building something with Lego and how do you see yourselves with your team uh, uh, when you are working. So I think metaphors also, uh, they can be really creative and they help people to to learn and to to transfer uh, learning. It is scientifically proven because uh, using metaphors, then you speak to the unconscious part of the brain or the subconscious part of the brain, which is super, super useful because this is how we make learning stick. And this is how people connect or resonate with it. I mean, it's not for nothing that the whole Bible is built on metaphors and, uh, and uh, little stories. And uh, you also mentioned something very that I love, very interesting for me. You said sometimes the metaphors can be also physical. And uh, in my world, this is called embodied metaphor. So when you say, for example, hey, I'm walking on eggshells around these people, and I love doing this as an exercise for people. So asking them to stand up and walk as if the whole room is full of eggshells. So they feel it in their body, how you are tied and how your whole perception about the person that you're working with and about yourself changes when you are in this state of mind and in this embodied state as well. And how this changes if, for example, if I tell them the next order is, Imagine that the room is full of bubbles and then people just play with the bubbles. They try to, to blow the bubbles and they are happy and they are intrigued. And yeah, so if you treat a team member, if as a senior executive, for example, you treat one of your um, managers as if you have to walk on eggshells around them and how different it is if you treat them as if they are bubbles that you want to play with them, you want to co-create with them, you want to help them grow. It changes, your perception changes the way that you work with them. And yeah, I, I love metaphors in that end because it can be very revealing of our own assumptions and our own behaviors in a, in a playful yet very provocative way because then you're confronted of your own um, of your own behavior in a way that nobody confronts you, so you don't have to resist, but you sense it in your body, and you're like, oh, oh yes, I do that, or oh, oh yeah, that's with Mary, I'm like eggshells, and with John, I'm like uh, bubbles, and ooh, ah. So for me, yeah, it's uh, it's a very big part of uh, learning. Yeah, it gives you different sensations. I like to work with the 
with our five senses because I think that learning uh, it's more transferable if you use your five senses and uh, it's it's more memorable and you can be more connected yeah well i think we've talked about very uh interesting things about the learning design i don't know if you want to add something else lena you know what there's something that uh, triggered me before and i would like uh, if you would like if you want to elaborate because you mentioned uh, key concepts that you are using right and then you're coming back to them uh, when you have longer sessions and uh, th that's something that i also love in uh, i see it in terms of spi spiral learning so instead of thinking learning as a linear process okay we cover topic A, we cover topic B, uh, then we're going to cover topic C and goodbye for the rest. And uh, according to all the philosophers of learners, uh, of learning and educators, they say that learning is spiral, right? It's constructive. You start and then you have to revisit it and revisit it again in different moments of time because this is what will help people uh, make it stick, of course, but also create connections within the concepts. And uh, I was, and that's something that sometimes I forget, and I know it, and I'm like, oh no, but I have to, you know, I have to come back to it and circle back to it because this is how uh, people will learn better, and this is how they will remember it. And uh, yeah, I was wondering how you do it. Like, um, do you do it in a visual manner? Do you um, uh, just bake in your um, your debriefing some elements? Uh, do you project the agenda? Like one thing that I love doing is that I play the agenda and then uh, there is always the part that we're going to work on that is uh, dominant and the other, the other ones are in shadow. And then so they can always look back into key concepts. But yeah, I'm open to hear more more ideas on how you do that. So I like at the beginning to 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 show them the agenda, and sometimes I have like a slide with that journey, and I keep showing that whenever we change uh, the theme. Uh, sometimes I give them space uh, at the end of each theme for them to tell me what were the key points. Sometimes I use post-its also to to put on the board with, with that. Sometimes I do that debriefing when I'm changing uh, topics. And then uh, also I tend to go back when I'm in another topic and I say, like we've seen in the other topic or like we've seen this morning or like we've seen last week and uh, I try to uh, connect that dots uh, in every every point so I can remind them of that I love that yeah yeah one one more thing that uh, comes to mind that I've done not in every sessions but in some sessions is that at the end before the closing to provide a nice uh, closed eye focus or meditation, a moment for meditation, where we go through a summary of what has been done through the day. And usually people appreciate it a lot. It's super fast, it can take like one or two minutes, but it helps people, okay, stay with themselves and think how they can, um, yeah, how all this has landed on them, just, just to let it flow in before they before they, we finish and they go to their next meeting or to their I don't know home <laughs> wherever they go at the end. Yes, I, I love that. Uh, sometimes I do that at the beginning also uh, a moment of mindfulness for them to focus on the session. Not in every I do that especially in emotional in intelligence. Yeah 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 these kind of things or difficult conversations. These kind of uh, topics, I think, uh, are more fruitful. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious, as a woman, have you encountered perhaps any issues in uh, learning design? I would say um, in the part of the designing, um, I think not. But 
when I'm actually giving the training, sometimes yes, depending uh, on the company, on the culture company or on the sector, sometimes I can feel that more, especially if I go to a company or my group of trainees are all men, for example, or they are in an area that are most men. Sometimes I feel that I need to prove my skills. Uh, nowadays, I don't feel... Um, I can deal with that. Uh, I don't feel afraid or anything. Um, but I think they can be more... They have a different uh, perspective of women. Sometimes they might think that I'm not going to be um, as uh, funny or have the same knowledge as if I were a man. I don't think if that happens to you, but in Portugal, we still have a culture of men especially in some areas, in some sectors. And, and uh, yes, I feel that I, can, I have to prove a lot more being a woman that I would need if I were a man. Yeah, stereotypes, right? Gender stereotypes. Yeah. It, it makes me very sad. And uh, I come from Greece originally. But I've never uh, really worked in Greece in uh, as a learning consultant. I've only I live in the Netherlands and I work with international organizations. So um, it's never one culture. <laughs> there are many cultures. Um, I don't really feel that there is that the, there is any kind of disadvantage because I'm a woman. But that's because that's until you mention the humor part, which I feel I, I like it a lot. <laughs> if I think of that, I'm like, oh my god, no, humor is not my strong point. When I make jokes, I laugh at myself. <laughs> but usually, one or two people out of politeness smile. The rest are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, other than this, no. For me, it was more about the age because when I started, I started in around 24, 25 years old. And uh, back then I was not working in the corporate sector. I was working with teachers. So they were teachers of the age of 40, 50, almost 60 before retirement. And I was a little girl, you know, 24 years old. And uh, yeah, back then I remember that I was not really receiving any vibes from them, but my own insecurities were very strong. I was like, oh my, what am I supposed to teach this? People, but um, yeah, experience helps, as you say, right? The more we grow into the field, and that helps with our confidence. And nowadays, I believe that if I believe in something, I'm gonna make it, and if I don't believe in it, I'm not gonna make it. So I better do things that I believe that it's gonna be okay. I can, I can be confident and project it as well, so people feel also more safe around me, and they can, I can create a psychological. Uh, safety for them to open up and not feel that okay we have now to prove something uh, or that whatever so yeah th th that's a mindset that that has helped me but I think it comes with experience and with the age as well at least for me yeah for me for me as well I, it was experience that uh, allowed me to deal with that in a with a different mindset yeah so I'm very sure of what I'm doing there and what's the point. So I go from there. And I, yes, I like to use a little bit of humor because I think it helps a lot. It really does. <laughs> yes, it helps a lot. Yes. <laughs> and give them positive emotions. So it's, it's good for, uh, for learning. Yeah, yeah, certainly. To help memory. <laughs> <laughs> But also you have your own fun, right? And that's if that's not it's like yeah. the most important to have your own fun when you give the training because people also feel it. And yeah, you go with a different energy when you're like, oh my God, it's going to be so cool what we're going to do today. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So Lena, I think we have a great... Thank you very much for 
sharing um, all of this. And thank you for, uh, thank you everyone who is listening and see you next time. Yes, it has been a pleasure for me and it really felt that we were just chit-chatting over a cup of coffee and a cake, cheesecake. <laughs> yeah. So, very nice. Uh, thank you and have a good day ahead. I enjoy all the episodes we record, but to cover an episode about learning profession and practice is always a highlight for me, if only because of some of the cool ideas I get from them. What about you? What did you get from this episode? please do let us know. Email in, leave a comment on LinkedIn, etc. You can find all our contact details in the show notes. An enormous thank you to Lena and Vanessa for their time and contribution. You'll find all their details, as always, in the show notes, along with links we think you'll appreciate. If you have trouble reading the notes because they're edited on some podcast players, you can find them all on our website, womentalkingaboutlearning.com. We'll be back in two weeks' time, and next time it's the assertive one. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll see you again soon.